Hello, and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. I'm, Ta I'm Pastor Tom Pickett. Thank you for joining with us today. We look forward to sharing the sermon message with you. My wife and I are filming this message in our living room. The title of today's message is Emptying Ourselves to Fill Ourselves with Trust in Jesus. Now that's a long title, and it means a lot. As we get into the subject, I hope you see that. I certainly have been seeing that this week as I've been preparing the message. We're in Lent season right now, approaching Easter, and we need to examine ourselves to see if we are in the right relationship with Jesus. This is critically important for the year to begin this way because Jesus is our answer to all of our problems and all of our needs. So let us start by praying to our Heavenly Father to ask for His guidance and inspiration. We thank you. Please join with me. We thank you, dear Lord God. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for providing us an opportunity to examine ourselves and see how we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So we ask and pray that you'll bless us and inspire us as we utilize the Word, the Scripture, uh, the spiritual food that we have to eat to see how we need to be in Christ thoroughly that we need to empty ourselves of ourselves and our carnal leanings and, and desires and to be totally filled with Jesus and trusting in Him for everything, our daily bread, uh, the work that we do, the ministry that we do, uh, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat everyone. We just ask and pray your blessing and inspiration that we'll see it in your scriptures how we should be in Jesus. We thank you, and we ask this now in His, in Jesus' holy name. And all together we say, Amen. Well, just as Jesus needed to empty Himself, so we need to empty ourselves. And you say, He needed to empty Himself? Why is that? Well, He needed to do that so He could minister to us and to serve us unto death. We'll see that over in the second chapter of Philippians. So if you'll turn there with me, if you have your Bible, please do. If you don't, and it's close at hand, please get it. I have the NIV version, and we want to look at Philippians, the second chapter, beginning in verse 1 today. Philippians 2, verse 1. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind, to be just like Jesus, because now as we believe in Him, He lives in us. He lives in our hearts. So in verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. And that's exactly how he treats us, and that's how we should treat each other. In verse 5, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. In other words, he emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. He stepped down from being the Word God to being God in human flesh. He had both natures, both godly and divine and human. In verse 8, then in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he emptied himself again because he was on a mission. He was on a mission to save us and not to condemn us. He by becoming obedient to death. He was going to go to the cross so that our sins could be forgiven, all sin for all time, even death on a cross. Now that's what Jesus did for us because He loved us and wanted us to be with Him for eternity. So in our loving our neighbor, as we have been loved by Jesus, we wouldn't have to go to the cross, but we would have to empty ourselves voluntarily. We would have to say, I want to not focus on me like I've been focusing on me, but I want to focus on Jesus because He's the answer to all of my needs. He's our daily bread, He's our provider and everything. We have to put Him first 
in all that we say and do. Now let's turn to uh, Matthew the fourth chapter because that as Jesus began his ministry, uh, he was going to be tempted. Another opportunity for him to uh, empty himself. Before he goes into his ministry, he wants to express that he puts his Father's will above any and everything. He's here for a purpose, to do his Father's will and to do it completely so that our Father receives all the glory and that is what he did. So he began in Matthew 4 and verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Yes, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. So the devil always said, if. He knew who he was. <laughs> there was no if here. But the tempter, like in the garden, if. And he beguiled Eve and and then Adam sinned because Eve ate and the apple ate and he ate it. But you see, the whole thing of it is, is Satan is the great deceiver. So even with Jesus, who was his creator, by the way, uh, he, he uses the term if. It could be a challenge. You know, and if the human nature that he had in him rose up, you know, and took over the divine nature he had, he wouldn't be doing his Father's will. So he answered to verse 4, It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. See, that's his Father's will. The Scripture is our Father's will. In verse 5, Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, and Satan uses Scripture too, and he says, Right here he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone, which is a correct reading of that, but it's the wrong application of it. As Jesus said in verse 7, he answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. So he knew his Father's will, and he used scriptures to sustain and to uplift the Father's will. In verse 8, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And the world does have a lot of splendor, but the universe has even more. That's where Jesus came from, to be with us on the earth. In verse 9, all this I will give you. And even though it would say, well, that's not a comparison that I would fall for. But if you're fully human, as well as fully God, yeah, that catches your eye. So the devil says, all this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Now, of course, you know, that goes totally against our Father's will, and the answer is no. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan. No, I will not. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And that is the answer our Father would have wanted Jesus to say, because that is the truth. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. You know, it just occurred to me as I was putting this message together, one of the reasons the angels would have gone to him to attend to him is because he was totally empty. During that trial and testing, 40 days of fasting, being tempted by the devil and answering correctly, because he did fulfill his Father's will, he was empty. And sometimes when we are empty because we're doing the work of the Lord in some way or the other, our angel would come and attend to us as well. As it says over in Hebrews 1, the angels are our servants. So, praise be to God. When we're empty, we need to be attended to, and Jesus was attended to by the angels. Well, now we need to die, we need to die to ourselves so that we can minister to Jesus and then to serve Him so that we can minister to and serve one another. That is our commission for this message. That's our desire to see and understand it and to utilize the scriptures to go forward in that direction. Let us begin in John, the 12th chapter. <clears throat> John, verse 12. Uh, here Jesus is going to be speaking to his disciples. John 12 and verse 23. John 12 and verse 23. Jesus replied, because <clears throat> he's predicting his death here, 
The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, but first he is going to have to die on a cross. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, and that's what was going to happen to him, it remains only a single seed. Now, that's not where we are yet. Because his dying is going to produce many seeds. We're talking about just one kernel. Jesus was going to die for all of us. The gospel would include many seeds in it because he died for all of us. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, So, that's what was going to happen. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in the world will keep it for eternal life. So, we've got to lose our life to have eternal life, because our life leads to death. The life Jesus gives us leads to eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me where I am. My servant also will be. We want to be where Jesus is. So now he lives in us through the Spirit, and we are with him and he is with us, but he will lead us then in the Spirit to go where he wants us to go. My Father will honor the one who serves me. And that is true. So you see, we have to give up our life voluntarily to have his life for eternity. It's what he did for us. You see, he died on the cross so that all could be saved. I mean, what love is that? That our Creator would do that for us. There's a love that is beyond me, even though I've known Jesus my whole life. I realize that I grow in his love. It's just beyond me. And I just love and appreciate it so much. And I hope and pray you do too. That's what Jesus would want for all of us. Now over in Matthew 16, Jesus also speaks to his disciples. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 24. Matthew 16 and verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. In other words, what we've done in following Jesus <laughs> and the fruit that he brings about in our lives and in our ministry. I mean, it's, com it's a complete trust in him. We give our lives over to him so we can, he can do with us whatever he wishes. But we know him because he is the full expression of our Father's love that he only has the best in mind for us. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will never lead us astray or go down some road that we shouldn't go down. We go down the right road, the road of life always. And we can, we can know that. Over in uh, Mark 8 now, if you'll turn there, and Mark the 8th chapter, beginning in verse 34. Mark 8 and verse 34. So, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. And is that the right one? Mark 8, verse 34. No, when he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. That's the world we live in today too. You know, we find ourselves, we could be ashamed of him and of his name. We have to not listen to man and woman. We need to listen to Jesus. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. We have to give up our life so we can have his life fully. His is the way to victory. He has full reward coming to us when he returns in glory. The Father's will is to share 
the full inheritance of his son and the son is willing to do that with us because we're his children. So we have to realize it's all or nothing. There's no halfway in this. We have to give everything we have because he's given everything he has for us. So we can be encouraged by that. He's not asking us to do anything he's not willing to do himself. And you always know that that's, that's always the proof of something being true. So we need to be just like the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her hair and poured expensive perfume on his feet. And this is the time of year we're in, you know, leading up to his crucifixion. She did all that she could to serve Jesus in his time of need. And that's all Jesus expects of any of us, is that we just do all we can do to serve him in his time of need, and therefore the needs of others as well. Let's look at that account over in Mark. Mark 14. <clears throat> Mark 14, verse 1. Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. And while he was in Bethany, reclining at the table of the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. And some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. See, that's what the self-righteous people say. And they rebuked her harshly. Then Jesus speaks. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and we do today. And you can help them anytime you want, and we do that too. But you will not always have me. Today we always have Jesus, but then that was not yet the case. Verse 8, she did what she could. She did what she could. That's all Jesus ever expects us, any of us to do. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare his body for the, the grave that was coming to prepare me for my burial. Truly, I tell you, whenever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her, and it's being done right now in the scripture. Praise be to God for this lady. There's another version of that over in Luke's account. In Luke and verse 7, beginning in verse 36, Luke 7 and verse 36. So when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. And when the Pharisees who invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, and she is a sinner. Well, Jesus was a prophet, and he absolutely knew who she was, and he came to save her, and me, and you, and all of us. Yes, he was very happy that she was worshiping him because he was her Savior. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Well, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and another 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Well, Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. 
Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. As her great love has shown, see, by her worship, she has shown her appreciation of her sins being forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Yes, Jesus is the one, our Savior. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you, go in peace. And that's what he tells us today to do, to go in peace. We believe that he is our Savior and we're willing to love much as he has loved us much because he now lives in us through his spirit and we can love much because we can empty ourselves by making a decision to do so of ourselves and receive more fully him every day of our lives. So we see today how we can be the new creation that we are in Jesus by joining with him to do his ministry of his reconciliation with our Father. See, there is something he wants us to do and it's found over in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5 beginning in verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. So when we have emptied ourselves and do that on a daily basis and we continually receive the fullness of Christ growing in his grace and knowledge, his love compels us because we are all convinced that one died for all and therefore all died and we all participate in it because we believe it. And one way of showing that is we're baptized to show that we believe that truth. It's a, it's a confirmation of our belief that he died for all. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So what Jesus has in mind for us to do, we're all for that to happen. We want to participate in that and have it go around the world so everybody can come to that truth and understanding and believe in him. Verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Again, we're emptying ourselves of our carnal impulses and desires and we're receiving fully because we reach out to Jesus to completely fill us with his spirit and his way of loving people. And we have a different point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this worldly way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come because the spirit of God lives in us. The old is gone, the new is here, right now as we believe, all this is from God, our Father. It was God the Father who sent Jesus. And He sent Jesus so that He had, could have the reconciliation take place that has happened. You see, before reconciliation with our Father could happen, Jesus had to die for all sin, to be paid. And we've all had that happen. We are now clean because the sin has been forgiven. And it is eternal. That's why we have this time of grace, because our sins have been forgiven. So our Father, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, he sent his son Jesus to us to do that. And therefore, we are reconciled with our Father, because sin has been forgiven. And he, our Father, has given us to Christ that we could do the ministry of his reconciliation. The reconciliation he did for us, for our Father, for that relationship to be restored. In verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That's what reconciliation is. It's the forgiveness of sin. Only Jesus could do that, and he has. And he has committed to us then the message of reconciliation. Our Father's counting on us to do this for him, to do and join with his Son's reconciliation ministry. You know, it's been done at the cross and after the cross, at the resurrection and at the giving of the Holy Spirit. But now it needs to go through around the world. We need to minister to people who've been abused by Satan and his society and his ways to know God and God's love in the way that Jesus has reconciled us to our Father. This is critically important for today's world that we live in. In verse 
20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, representing his kingdom of light, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That is critically important for us. How can we possibly empty ourselves and be fully filled with Jesus and not do what we've been asked to do by our Father? It's to join with Jesus and participate and minister in his ministry of reconciliation to help the world come to see that the most important thing we can say right now is be reconciled to God. And all of our problems and all of our need, this is the greatest thing we can say to one another. In verse 21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Yes, his righteousness has been attributed to us. Thanks be to God for that. And now we're holy. <laughs> we can be the children of God, reconciled to our Father. Isn't that great news? So here we are. You know, it goes now into chapter 6 and verse 1. Here we, we, stand, we stand at the door waiting to go through. As God's co-workers see, that comes right after chapter 5. As God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. And as it was then, so it is now. And perhaps now more than ever. Because before the glorious return of Jesus, there is a work to be done by us, the believers in Jesus, who are willing to become empty of our carnal desires to become fulfilled in our spiritual reality. That is who we are. We're the children of God. And we are reconciled by Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. He is our living Savior and Lord and living high priest today. Praise be to God. Please join with me in prayer. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for sending Jesus to us. We are so blessed that you have saved us and not condemned us. Instead, Jesus perfectly fulfilled your will. And now we are your children, reconciled to you, Father, with full rights of inheritance. We are so blessed to know you as our Father. And we thank you for Jesus. Please help us now to join with him in his ministry of reconciliation to help everybody come to the same conclusion in our world that we need to be reconciled to God. You're the only hope. You're the only hope we need. You're the only answer. You're the only answer we need. You've given us the answer in Jesus. And we pray and ask this now in his holy and precious name. In the name of Jesus we pray. And all together we say, Amen.